Would you believe that there is a new way of doing CFD? Well, there is, and this is especially interesting considering that the ways we do CFD haven't really changed very much, at least over the past 20 years. I mean, Navier-Stokes CFD solvers have been around as long as computers themselves, and the general idea of them even predates that. Then over the past 20 years or so, lattice Boltzmann solvers have seen an increased popularity. But apart from that, there isn't really much of a difference in how we do CFD lately, but now there is. And to be honest, it is ingeniously simple. I mean, it is so obvious yet isn't really known about. And this method is by combining known experimental results as effectively boundary conditions in the CFD model. So to give you an idea of what this is, imagine you have your CFD model. It can be whatever, whatever you like, doesn't really matter. Now you have your mesh and you start to solve, but every iteration or so, you then check the flow fields and compare it to what your experiments say it should be. You then use your experimental data to anchor the values at strategic points about the mesh to force the CFD simulation to converge to meet those requirements. As such, the rest of the flow around the, that doesn't have any experimental results are anchored to that in an indirect way because these boundary conditions effectively in the flow will not change. So your CFD is being pushed to the solution you know is already correct, or at least the solution that matches your validation data. With that, it is easy to expect more accurate simulations because you have more points to anchor your final solution, but also you'd expect the simulation to solve much quicker because you have more information guiding the solution as opposed to just letting it run however it likes. Also, you'd think that it could even make the solution more stable and less likely to diverge because you have now certain points that the CFD knows it should be going towards. So this CFD approach is so simple when you think about it, and personally, I can't believe that I haven't really thought about it before, but does it work? So to find out, we are looking at this paper, which is called Grid Convergence Property of Three-Dimensional Measurement Integrated Simulation for Unsteady Flow Behind a Square Cylinder with Car from Carmen Vortex Street. So this is open access and you can find it in the link below. And you may want to download this one because it is quite good and the stuff it, ca it covers might influence CFD in the future. So these researchers who wrote this paper seem to be part of a research group that has been looking into this method for a while. And from what I can tell, they are really pushing this field. They are also looking at a square cylinder, which I think is significantly more interesting and harder to validate which this method, um, with this method as it seems. So this is because the square cylinder is bluff. So if you were to use a streamlined body like an airfoil of 30 degrees, it would be significantly easier to incorporate the experimental data because you don't have the fluctuating component with time. The flow is steady. With the cylinder, you now have to factor in the fluctuations, which make things much more difficult. So this paper is a significant step forward in this method. So let's dive into what they did and whether it worked. So they call this method in this paper, how you combine CFD with experimental data as CFD measurement integrated or CFD MI for short. So they took laser Doppler velocimetry measurements around the cylinder and they compared 2D and 3D simulations. So for both the 2D and 3D, they had regular CFD approaches where you create the mesh and let simulation take its course. So that's the regular CFD. But then in addition to that, they also ran their CFD MI approach where they then had their CFD results with their measurements from their LDV and then have those LDV measurements to force the CFD into a certain solution. So let's look at how they integrated their measurements here. In equations one, two, and three here, let me zoom in a little bit. We see how they did it, how they actually factored it into their CFD mathematically. So first, let's look at equations one and two. So these are the Navier-Stokes equation and the pressure recovery equation, respectively. Now, everything looks pretty much the same, except you can see at the end of each equation, this letter F in bold. And these represent the artificial force added to these equations based on how different the current simulation is from the measurement results. The greater the difference between these two are, the greater the force becomes. So you can think of this as a correcting force kind of thing. So if you have your CFD and you run it and a certain iteration, you look at one point and the value is a certain amount and then the experiments say it should be another amount, that creates this correcting force, this F. And in figure three, we see a similar situation where again, you have correcting forces added to the momentum forces, sorry, in equation three. 
to the momentum equations based on the difference between the pressure in the simulation and the experiment. So again, the greater the differences in this pressure at a certain point, the greater the forces will be to correct the CFD. And again, uh, when these differences approach zero, these correcting forces vanish because the simulation is now in agreement with the experiments. So the integration of the experimental data with the CFD is really quite simple when you think about it, it's just a, a couple extra additions here. So one thing that I'm a little curious about though is how there doesn't seem to be any damping in these equations from what I can tell at least. So what I mean by that is the greater the difference between the CFD and the experimental data, the greater the correcting forces become. But there are certain situ situations where I wonder if that would lead to potential instabilities in the CFD. So for example, say you are looking at just simulating the flow and you're starting off. And obviously there are going to be major differences between the CFD and the experiments to begin with because the CFD hasn't really iterated through much at all. So the correcting forces will be very high. And that I wonder if the derivatives become so great then that it potentially crashes the simulation or whether that takes longer for the CFD uh, takes to correct the flow. So maybe that's how they damp out the potential uh, flip-flopping back and forth in the, in the forces. Alternatively, if you have a fluctuating flow, what is stopping the correcting forces coupling with the CFD's tendency to correct itself and produce an overcorrection? I'm really interested in the finer details here, but in this paper, they don't seem to give anything more. Maybe the time steps were small enough to reduce the potential divergence. I don't know. Anyway, let's go to their CFD setup now. Now, they say that they used an algorithm similar to the simpler method. So I guess that means that their CFD was RANS, hence steady state and not transient. So this is really interesting. And <laughs> because on the one hand, the steady stateness would help reduce potential overcorrections because it is more stable to begin with. But on the other hand, how can experimental data that is based on transient processes be used to correct the steady state approximation? That would always lead to the correcting forces being required as a steady state CFD would never align with the experimental data. Or maybe they introduced um, the introduction of the transient data may somehow make the steady state CFD become more quasi-transient. These are all interesting questions and hopefully we'll come across papers in the future that will answer them and maybe we'll get some answers in this paper as well. So anyway, in figure two, we see their wind tunnel and CFD setups. Here we go, figure two. And the square cylinder had a length of 30 millimeters and was located 85 millimeters from each wall. So this wall and this wall. The mesh was 300 millimeters upstream and there was plenty of downstream room over two meters uh, for the flow to develop down here. And they looked at three different uh, grid densities. The coarsest grid had 49,000 cells the next level up had eight times the number of cells at 400,000 cells. And the next level up again had eight times again, and that was 3.1 million cells. So I must say that their refinements were massive jumps each time. Each time they increased the total number of cells by a factor of eight, which usually that's <laughs> a lot. Anyway, the velocity was set at 0 0.6 meters per second, which gave a Brenner's number of 1200. So that's quite low. That's definitely in the laminar range. So now one thing that I should mention is, and this applies pretty much to all experimental data you see published, whenever you get that Reynolds number here is 1200, the chances are that that wasn't the exact Reynolds number because the Reynolds number is based on the density, viscosity, and velocity, which all change with changing atmospheric conditions. And throughout the day and between days, the temperature, barometric pressure, and humidity all change. As such, when you're testing over a period of time, the Reynolds number isn't just one value, it fluctuates. So in the MC Hawk link below, we go through the math and how much it changes throughout a day and how to fix it. So on this test, while I report a Reynolds number of 1200, chances are that that was a range of Reynolds numbers seen during this test. Anyway, for the CFD, they use a time step of 0.01 seconds. And the von Kármán vortex shedding frequency found in the wind tunnel was 2.81 Hertz. In table one, they show the difference in the time it took to run each simulation with each mesh. So down here. And the finest mesh took over 100 times longer to run than the coarsest mesh. And that is primarily because of the great number of cells and also because they used more cores, which reduced efficiency. So let's jump to the results section now and see how this new CFD method worked and if it was accurate or not. So in figure four, just here, we see the pressure 
at the feedback point in the CFD. On the left is for the regular CFD with no measurement integration. So this is just a regular CFD result. On the right, we see with the measurement integration. Let's focus on the left first. So we see something that's actually gives a lot of researchers headaches. And <laughs> back about 15 years ago, this was a really um, contentious topic. So the thick black line we see here is for the measurements. This like thick black gray line. Let me zoom in a little bit, actually. Here we go. So as you'd expect, it fluctuates up and down with this pressure uh, at this point in this CFD, uh, based, uh, sorry, in the experiments in this case, based on where the cycle of the vortex shedding of the cylinder is. So that makes a lot of sense. It goes up and down in the von Kármán fashion. But now looking at the CFD, we get some strange artifacts. So first for the two coarsest grids, which you can see are the dashed lines here, they are very straight and they don't fluctuate. And this is what you'd expect from a RAN simulation because the flow is steady state. So how can you get fluctuations when that's a transient process? And obviously these two grids don't give results even close to the experimental results because the transients first the steady state. But going to the finest grid now, grid C, which is this thin black line, we see that it wiggles around in a very similar way as we get from the experiments, it fluctuates. Um, so now we have a steady state CFD simulation that is exhibiting a transient phenomenon. That doesn't make sense because in the RANS equations, there is no time component. So how can you get fluctuations in time? And this was something that many people were struggling to grasp about 15 years ago when URANS came around and it became mainstream. So for those of you who don't know, URANS stands for unsteady RANS. So unsteady Reynolds average Navier-Stokes. And when this CFD approach became mainstream, many researchers were saying, well, how can you have a transient implementation of a steady state approach? You've literally filtered out all the transientness and now you're somehow trying to put it back into it. Rands has literally removed all of this. How can it be accurate? Well, it turns out that this works out quite well and not now not um, as well as LES or DES, but still you get pretty good results with URANS at least of the microscopic uh, phenomena like von Kármán vortex streets. But here we have just a regular RANS situation. And actually you can get this phenomenon occurring here because even though you're not supposed to, and this is because between iterations, there are imbalances in the system that then propagates through effectively um, each iteration and that mimics time. It's not really time, it just mimics it. So that is why we are getting here in this finest grid, grid C, this fluctuating unsteady phenomenon effectively. And this um, Z axis should really not be time, it should be um, more iteration. That would make much more sense for the steady state approach. But anyway, um, while we can get this general phenomenon, as you can see, it is out of phase with experiments. You can see it's always out of phase as we go along. And that is because it can't actually do this transit phenomenon, but this transit phenomenon still bleeds through in this pseudo time step kind of thing. So this, in my opinion, is like kind of like the ghost in the machine kind of thing where you get your program, <laughs> you program the computer to do something, but somehow additional things happen that you don't intend on. Now, this is in this case is just effectively a mathematical uh, peculiarity, but still. So bringing this all back to CFD with the measurement integration, this is figure 4A shown uh, here is the regular CFD. Let's move to figure 4B because we can see in figure 4A, none of the CFD approaches really work that well. In figure 4b, we see a very different picture. We still have the measurement data, but now for every mesh, every mesh uh, CFD, even the coarsest one, we get very good approximations for the pressure fluctuations throughout time. The phase is bang on for each mesh, and the mesh gets, as it gets finer, the magnitudes in the pressure fluctuations get closer and closer to what they should be. So that right there is proof of just how powerful this CFD MI approach is. I mean, even for the coarsest mesh, which is only 40,000 cells, which is almost nothing, we get pretty decent results, all things considered. And this gives so much hope to CFD because the major thorn in CFD's side is a lack of computational power. We don't have enough CPUs or even RAM sometimes, and in many fields, we're hitting a wall as our CPU um, power is stalling. But with this CFD MI approach, you can shave off like 90% of the time because we saw here before that the coarsest mesh took like one hundredth of it, uh, the time that it took to do the finest mesh. So now a billion cell mesh is within reach and not just for hardcore research. So to give you an idea of the difference this can make. So I have a friend who was doing his PhD recently and he was struggling to finish his PhD because he had to use a billion cells and even more 
for his simulations and to run just one simulation took weeks. So his PhD became impractical. So reducing simulation time by 90% or more, which is if this approach holds true, uh, will become a reality, is a massive achievement. So let's go further and look at the results more. We can see here that the overall results match really nicely for the CFD MI. Let's go further. So in figure five, we see the Struhl number for these various CFD runs with the experiments. And we see the 2D and 3D cases. I'll zoom in a little bit here as well. So for both the 2D and 3D cases, it is clear that the measurements integrated CFD um, go from not uh, very accurate. I mean, if there's no CFD integration, if there's no measurement integration, there's like a 20% difference to what it should be. And then with the measurement integration in the MI, they're now bang on the short number compared to the experiments. That's huge. So in figure seven, we see the mean velocity fields. If I scroll down here, so on the left, we see the regular CFD results. And on the right, we see for the measurement integrated CFD. And there isn't that much of a difference. This is for the mean velocities, by the way, just to emphasize that. There isn't that much of a difference between uh, the finest meshes. For the coarsest meshes, okay, the regular CFD has a much greater wake. And looking at figure six on the left, we see the experimental data and what it should be compared to the CFD, which is very wrong. But for the CFD MI, on the right here, even for the coarsest mesh, the results are pretty close to experimental data. You can see for this MI compared to the experiments. Now in figure eight, we see the velocity fluctuations for the regular CFD on the left and for the CFD MI on the right. Comparing these data with experimental data in figure 6b, which is what it should be, the regular CFD doesn't agree very well until you get to the very fine mesh. On the other hand, the CFD MI agrees quite well already for the coarse mesh, and as you get uh, finer, the results get better and better, as you can see here. So that shows that the CFD MI results are always better compared to just the regular CFD. Now let's go to figure nine, because we see the errors in the CFD compared to the experimental data for the regular CFD and the CFD MI with different spacings. It is very obvious that for the CFD MI, regardless of whether it is 2D or 3D, we have far, low, far fewer errors. The errors are far lower for these two compared to the regular CFD. And in figure 10, we see the isosurfaces of the velocity components, U on the left, V in the middle, and W on the right. These velocity fields look very similar to what you typically expect from an experiment for a transient or a transient simulation. Um, so to get such detail for a RAN simulation is impressive, and all with just a few points in the field to force the CFD to converge like this. And with that, we come to the end of this podcast. I have to say that this may be the most important podcast we have covered over the past 186 podcasts so far, because this presents a new CFD method that really works in not only improving the the accuracy of the CFD simulations, but also dramatically cutting down the number of cells you need and hence the time it takes to run the simulation. That's the holy grail of CFD. And while everyone is working to improve the accuracy through more time consuming CFD approaches, they're hitting brick walls. Um, approaches like this are what we need to make CFD better. And I really like this paper. It shows that this measurement integration process makes the CFD so much more accurate and it is very effective and you don't need that many points like a couple just a few put in the in the mesh will be enough and on that note if you want to learn how to do open foam check out our course below and if you want to make your experiments more accurate as i mentioned earlier there are errors in most aerodynamic data and the researchers don't even know about it the errors are usually about over two percent and in the hawk link we cover the math of it and what to do to fix it so if you like this podcast, make sure to like and hit the follow button, whichever platform you're on. And I'll see you next one. Peace, amigos.